Are you ready for battle? Our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, just looking for someone to devour. We need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We have to put on the full armor of God. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Put on the helmet of salvation with the breastplate of righteousness in place and your feet fitted with the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith against the enemy's arrows. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Remember, be constant in prayer and alert. And with the power of the spirit, you will win the battle. Amen. Good morning. So, in ancient times, war elephants were the tanks in the day. See, their tough hides made their, them almost impervious to arrows. And their giant size made them perfect for trampling through enemy lines. It was reported that even Alexander the Great was terrified at the thought of these elephants. See, their reputation grew even more fierce when Hannibal set out to storm Rome with an armada of these ferocious beasts. The elephantry seemed invincible. But if elephants were the first tanks, then flaming pigs slathered in tar, lit on fire, and set loose to wreak havoc were the world's first anti-tank missiles. Scholars of the day said the weapon worked because elephants were scared of the squeal of the pigs. The flaming pigs were, in fact, successful, it was reported, in one battle. But the rest of their battles were highlighted by serious drawbacks of this tactical barbecue. You see, the lifespan of a flaming pig was pretty short. In fact, you had to be within 400 yards or less for them even to work. So the enemy had to be almost on top of you before you could even release the flaming pigs. The bacon missiles also didn't have a guidance system. And so when they would be set loose, they found that they were woefully inaccurate. That they just went wherever they pleased many times setting fire to their own camps. And so that is why the flaming pigs quickly were, were they found another way to combat the elephants. And here's, here's the point of that story. How you were equipped for battle matters. You see, over the last few weeks, we have been looking at what it means to put on God's armor. Pastor Jason reminded us four, four weeks ago that we are in a battle. It's not a choice. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are in a spiritual battle. And praise the Lord, we see in chapter six of Ephesians, we've been looking at the armor of God that he has given us to be able to withstand the tax of our enemy. And so today, we're gonna pick up on the next piece of armor in Ephesians chapter six, verse 16. So would you follow along as I read that verse for us? Paul says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, I want us to go through this verse this morning, phrase by phrase. And so let's start with this very first phrase, in all circumstances, take up. Now, if you've been following along and you've been paying attention, you will see a shift in language here. The first three pieces of armor that we've looked at, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness and having our feet shod with the preparation that comes from the gospel of peace. You will notice the language Paul used for those three were to put on. But now, beginning in verse 16, he says, in all circumstances, take up. 
You see, those first three pieces, those would have been everyday attire for the soldier. He would have worn the breastplate and the belt and had his feet with the shoes on that he needed just so he was ready for a battle whenever he might be called upon to fight. But these next three pieces that we're gonna see, these were the pieces that a soldier would never dream of not having when it was time for the battle. When the battle began, these next three pieces, Paul says, we take these up. We make a conscious effort. We, we can't go into battle. A soldier wouldn't dream of going into battle without these three pieces. And so the first one that he says is take up the shield of faith. He admonishes us to take it up. Now, what is this shield? Let's think about the shield for just a minute because there are different kinds of shields and different ones may be coming into your mind. You may have, you know, like a knight in, in shining armor, medieval warfare and, and armor. Or you may have, like I do when I think of a shield, my mind goes to Captain America, right? The cool, round shield with the star in the middle that he can sling. Oh, I love, it's my favorite Avenger. Um, but you may have that shield in mind, right? A small shield that would be worn on the arm. But that's not the shield that Paul is referring to here. You see, this shield that he's talking about, it would have been about four and a half feet tall and anywhere from two and a half to almost three feet wide. This is the shield that a Spartan mother would have been talking about. It's a famous line from, from the Spartans where a, where a mother would tell her son as, she were, as he was going off to battle, she would say, come home carrying this shield or being carried on it. Meaning fight worthy, fight with honor. But it's a shield big enough that a soldier really could be placed upon it if he were wounded or he had died in battle. So it's a shield this big. An a soldier's entire body could get behind that shield in battle if necessary. You know, as, a, as an Old Testament scholar and a Pharisee, Paul, as he was writing this, these words to take up the shield, I imagine that the words of the psalmist would have been in his mind as he wrote this. And I want you to look at just at three different psalms that would have referenced a shield and how important it would have been. Look at Psalm 18, verse 30. He says that he is, that God is a shield for those who would take refuge in him. Those who would take refuge in him. He is a shield for those. Psalm 28, verse 7. He says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. In him do I put my trust and am helped. Psalm 119, verse 114 says that you, Lord, you are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Do you see the picture of the shield? Do you see why Paul would talk about this here in this moment as he's talking about taking up the armor of God? And he says, take up the shield, that place of refuge, that place of strength, that place of security. You see, the shield, this image gives us a clear picture of the shield that we are to take into battle. But Paul gives us great clarity and telling us what kind of shield we need in the spiritual battle. He says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of what? Of what? Of faith, the shield of faith. Now the word faith, that's a word that gets thrown a lot around a lot in our day, doesn't it? We hear that word in our culture today, faith. Faith, what, what are we talking about when we talk about it? We're, many times we're saying, put faith or believe in yourself, right? Have faith in yourself, believe in yourself. Many times when we, when we see faith in action, we see people putting their faith or their trust in things like relationships, right? 
If I could just date this person, or if I could just marry this person, or if I could just even outside of marriage, if I could just know this person, right? If I could just make this connection or that connection, I'm putting my faith in relationships. That is what will get me where I want to go and what I need. So I trust in those. Many times we put our faith in our professions, right? We find great security. So we put our faith in what we do. We put our faith in how much money is in our bank accounts. Sometimes we put our faith in nationalism, right? I put my faith in my country. If my country were just what it needed to be, then my life would be what it needs to be. We trust in that. Sometimes we talk about having faith in science or having faith in technology. See, we use the word often. We practice the word even more frequently by putting our trust in things. You know, there is a real sense that if you just have faith or a sincere belief, that's all you need, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe. We hear this talked about in reference to religion, right? It doesn't matter who you worship as long as you worship. If you just have belief, sincere belief that all roads lead to the same place, right? We, we use this word to describe things like that, but there's a real problem with that. You see, when we use the word faith, we, we put a lot of stock in the word itself, that there's power in the word faith, but can I tell you something? Think about it with me for a minute. There is no inherent value or power in the word faith itself. Belief, there is no power in belief or trust. Where is the power? It's in the object. Right, It's in the object of where we've placed our faith or our trust. That is where the power lies, the object of our faith. So when Paul says to take up the shield of faith, what is, he, what is the object, right? I mean, since we're reading out of Scripture, right, we, I, I think everybody in this room would say, well, faith has something to do with God. Right, so, so is he saying when we take up the shield of faith that it's just a generic belief in a supreme being? Is that what we need in the battle? Is it just this belief, well, God exists. I know he's there. Or maybe it's just giving intellectual assent, right? Or saying with our mouths, well, I know God is powerful. I know God is in control. Right? I know God is, I know God is love. I know God has, is, is gracious and merciful, right? We start reciting these characteristics and attributes we know of God, right? We will say the words. Is, is that what he's talking about? Just, just a knowledge? Is that what it means to take up the shield of faith? You know, we've been going through Paul's letter to the Ephesians for a while now. And I don't know if you've picked up on it as you've gone along, but the word faith is a word that Paul has used over and over throughout this letter. And so if, if as, as this church, as, as these believers in Ephesus would have been reading this letter, if this was all they had to understand what faith was, what Paul was talking about when he said, take up the shield of faith, what would they have known about faith? I'm gonna put some verses up here on the screen for you, just journeying through the entire letter. Look at what Paul said about faith in Ephesians 1.13. He says that through faith, they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Verses 15 and 19 of the same chapter, he says through faith, they can know the hope to which they were called. And then he goes on to say they could also know the riches of their inheritance and the power of God that was at work on their behalf. He says in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 8, it's through faith that we can have a relationship with Christ. Many of us have that verse memorized, right? That we are saved by grace through faith. 
Chapter three, verse 12, he says that it is through faith that we have boldness and confident access to God. Verse 17 of chapter three, he says that it is through faith that we are filled with all of the fullness of God. Chapter four and verse five, faith is how we walk worthy of the calling that we have received. And verse 13 of chapter four, he says that it's faith that produces spiritual maturity and it strengthens the body of Christ. So what's the bottom line? Well, for this church, as they read this, as they went back and they tried to understand, it would have been crystal clear for them that the only object that they could place their faith in that could produce these things was Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, amen? He is the only one that can do that. And Paul is saying to them, when you take up the shield of faith, you are placing your trust. Literally, the word itself, it was, there was a missionary that was, that was working with an unreached people group and he was trying to translate the scriptures into their language and they had no word for faith in their language. And he was trying to translate this word and think, how can I explain faith? And one of the, one of the natives came into to where he lived and they were exhausted and they just dropped down and placed their entire weight on a chair in front of him. And in that moment, he said, that's it. That is the word faith. It is placing all of our weight in something, believing that it can support us. You see, church, when we take up the shield of faith, we are saying that we are placing all of our weight, all of our hope, all of our security, we are placing it in the sufficiency of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. Now, the next part of this verse tells us why it's so important that our faith is in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. He tells us next here, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, I want us to pause for just a minute here, right? We read that you know, and many times we just keep going if we're reading the, this entire section, but I want you to think for just a minute what are the implications of this right here? Here's what I thought of, is I thought, this is not a safe place to be. I mean, if there are flaming darts or flaming arrows raining down on us, that is not a safe place to be. Flaming darts are dangerous, right? I mean, arrows in and of themselves are dangerous, but when you set them on fire, I mean, that just takes up the seriousness of, of the battle that much more. No one wants to find themselves in a place where fiery arrows are raining down. Am I right? I mean, we, th that is not a place we would choose to be. But what have we learned over the last few weeks? The reality is that we are in a spiritual battle and that there are flaming darts going to fly. Satan's tactics are to use situations, circumstances, trials in our life, things that we face to fire his flaming darts, hoping to wreak havoc in our lives and inflict mortal, devastating wounds on us. Our enemy wants to use the things that we walk through, that we experience throughout the journey of life. He wants to take those situations and find those moments to release those arrows into our lives. You know, I can, I can think of some examples in my life where this has been proven true. One situation I can think of back in 2005, 
My wife and I got married in 2000, and, and the first few years of our marriage were tough. My wife lost both of her parents. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a tough season. And in 2005, I was working in a church, and, and without going into the whole story, um, it was, I saw a side of ministry that I, I don't ever wanna see again. And, and there were a lot of things done to where in 2005, I threw up my hands and said, I don't wanna do this. If this is what ministry looks like, I'm out. And so I went back to work for Chick-fil-A, trying to convince myself that that I could that I could I could serve the Lord and minister to people owning my own Chick-fil-A. I thought I could help God out by 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 doing fulfilling what I thought he had called me to do as a junior in high school through owning my own Chick-fil-A. And so I began pointing my feet in that direction. Well, you know what was going through my mind during this time? I was, I was hurt, I, I, was, I was confused, I was angry. I felt like, God, in, in 1995, you called me. I thought I heard you clearly call me to vocational ministry. And this is what it looks like? This is what I was doing? Why? I mean, all the questions going through my mind. And you know the dart that Satan just kept lobbing, firing into my own heart and life was run. It's not worth it. Pick something else. Do it your own way. In 2011, my father, um, went through a very short battle with colon cancer. And in August of 2011, God took him home. Some of you know, I'm the oldest of eight kids. Four of them were still living in the home. They were still young. They were not even out of high school when he passed away. As the oldest of those eight kids, grieving the loss of my father, who really was, as an adult, he had been a great godly father as a child. And so as an adult, I enjoyed a relationship with him that was like a best friend. So during those moments of walking through that, of grieving myself, the arrows that the enemy was launching at my heart right then was how are you gonna do this alone? How are you gonna be enough to help your mom and your sisters and your brother? How are you gonna do it? You're not strong enough. You can't do it on your own. Give up. Most recently in, in 2019, we, my family and I had moved uh, from one state to another and believing that God had called us. And it became very clear quickly that the situation was not at all what it had been communicated to be. And I went through a season there where I felt like the biggest failure that you could imagine. I mean, the arrows that were being launched, those fiery darts that were coming at me were arrows that said, you let your family down. How can you call yourself a pastor when you might have missed hearing the voice of God in your own life? You failure. Dart after dart fired into my own life. You know, there's examples in scripture of people who went through spiritual battles. One in particular that I think of is David. In Psalm chapter three, David writes this Psalm as he's fleeing from his son, Absalom. 
Absalom has, has been successful in usurping the throne from his own father. And David has to flee for his life from Jerusalem because he doesn't want to go to battle with his own son. And if he's not going to do that, all he can do is get out of town. And if you know about the life of David, you can just imagine as he's in this caravan of his children and his, and his people that attend to him as they are leaving Jerusalem, can you just imagine what would be going through his mind in this moment? He'd be thinking, My family is a mess, and it's my fault, right? I I had an affair with Bathsheba. I killed her husband. I've had children die. I've had a son rape one of my daughters. My family is in shambles, and it's my fault. I've now had a son turn against me and want the throne, And now I've lost my whole nation. My whole nation has turned against me. Can you just imagine the arrows that the enemy was firing at David in this moment? Man, David, look at the disaster you've made of your life. Remember when you were that shepherd boy? Remember when you slayed Goliath and your faith was so strong? What happened to you? God could never love you. God could never use you. Run, go hide in the caves again. That's where you belong. I mean, can you just imagine what was going through his mind? But I love what he writes in Psalm chapter three in verse three. Look at what it says. David says, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me. My glory, and I love this line, and the lifter of my head. Praise the Lord, David, in this moment when the arrows were flying, in one of the most darkest, hopeless moments of his life, we see David taking up the shield of faith. We see David, as the arrows are raining down, take refuge in the character of God. Right as we continue, If we would continue reading through the psalm, we would see that David was reminded of God's grace and God's mercy. We see that David was reminded of God's faithfulness. And we see that David was reminded of God's power, his sovereignty, and ultimately his goodness. And as he is being reminded of the truth of who God is, that is why he can write what he wrote that says, Lord, you are a shield, and he can take refuge and who God is, and know that he will lift his head, that he will sustain him and set his feet on solid ground. What a beautiful picture it is. I'm so glad, I'm so thankful that the Lord gave us this picture of David in this moment. Because just like examples from my own life, or just like examples from David's life, I know in this room today that there's fiery darts that the enemy is is firing in your life. And many times we come into the room and, and we're conditioned in this room to cover that up. We don't want people to see that we're in a battle. We don't want people to know. We want to, we want to keep that hidden, hoping that it'll just go away, hoping that people won't know the fiery darts of the enemy that are being lobbed into our circumstances and our situations and the trials that we face. You know, some of, some of our enemy's favorite places to just launch those darts can come into relationships. Maybe it's a marriage and maybe, maybe you've been married a long time or maybe you've just been married a few years, but just the cares of life have just sucked the life out of your marriage. 
and all the hopes and all the dreams and all the things that you thought marriage could be. Now you're sitting there wondering, does my wife care about me? Or you're wondering, what can I do for my husband to notice me? We're like two strangers living in a house. All we do is fight. All we do is argue. And in the midst of those situations and those circumstances, the enemy looks and he takes aim and he fires a dart saying it's beyond repair. Throw in the towel. Look for fulfillment somewhere else. Maybe you're single and all you want is to feel loved and, 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 to, and to, to, to be married. You desire that, and, it is, and it's a good desire. You feel like it's a godly desire. You wanna have a home, and you wanna have a family. But for whatever reason, God hasn't brought that person into your life, and you're single. And so Satan looks in those moments, and he takes aim, and he says, no one's ever gonna love you. Something's wrong with you. What's the matter with you? That you're unlovable. Maybe you're dating. Maybe you're a student in the room and, and you're, you're old enough now to be dating and you're thinking that, that, that gives me value if I have a boyfriend or I, ha I have a girlfriend and, and, and you want that relationship and you're putting so much stock in that that will give you value and so the enemy is waiting and he wants to launch an arrow that says... Compromise whatever you have to in order to keep that relationship. Maybe it's not relationships. Maybe it's a crisis you're facing. Maybe it's a financial crisis. You've, you've spent more than you made and, and the credit card debt is piling up and, but maybe there's been cutbacks and, and, and you don't know how you're gonna make ends meet and it's becoming a crisis situation. And so the enemy just launches that arrow that says there's no way out. It's never gonna get any better. And you're in that hopeless situation. Maybe it's a loss. Maybe you've experienced loss. Someone close to you has passed away. And the enemy looks at you in the midst of your grief, in the midst of your brokenness, and he fires that dart that says, if God was real, he could have prevented this. Maybe it's your career. Maybe, maybe, maybe you've lost your job. Your needs will never be met. Maybe you got passed up for a promotion at work. What you do doesn't matter. Maybe if you were honest, you would sit here and say, I'm a workaholic. I, I spend so much time on my career and on my profession because deep down, I think it's what gives me value and worth. And the enemy would say, work harder because you're nothing without doing what you do. Maybe it's a family situation. Maybe you're in the midst of raising children and, and, and you're just exhausted and you're tired and sometimes you don't know, <laughs> if, you know when you get up in the morning if you're gonna get through another day and the enemy looks in those situations and dart after dart, he sends darts that's, that's of fear, of doubt, darts that say, I'm not enough. I'm not gonna be able to raise my children and give them what they need. And we feel inadequate in those moments. Maybe you've got adult children in this room. Maybe they're far from God. And the enemy launches those darts of guilt that say it's your fault. Those darts of worry that say, what's gonna happen to them? Dart after dart, he fires into our life. Maybe it's a health situation. Maybe it is a diagnosis of cancer in your life and the darts rain in that says, if God loved you, he wouldn't have allowed this to happen. 
Maybe you're suffering from a chronic condition of some kind. And you think, because of those darts flying, Satan plants those, those, those lies in your life that say, God must be punishing me. Maybe just the natural process of life, you're aging and you can't do what you once were able to do. You've got limitations now. And those darts fly, fly in those quiet moments that say, you've got nothing left to offer. Habits in our life, secrets, addictions. We, we could go on and look at situation after situation where the enemy steps in, if there's an, if the, it, it, like with pornography, and says, don't, don't confess it, don't bring it into the light for someone to help you. Keep it hidden because nobody would understand. Maybe you struggle with alcohol and you say, I just, one more drink is all I need. And Satan says, you're not strong enough to quit. Maybe it's your past. Maybe there's a mistake in your past. And the devil launches those darts that say your mistakes define you. You're less than, you'll never be good enough now. What happened was your fault. You see, the reality of living in a sinful, broken world is that we're all gonna face circumstances. We're all gonna go through trials and temptations. The question we have to answer as followers of Jesus is what are you gonna do when the enemy wants to use those realities of living in a sinful world to hurl his flaming darts at you? That's the question that has to be answered through this text today. Are we going to take up the shield of faith? Because see, that is the only way that we can extinguish those darts that the enemy wants to hurl. And it can't be a faith that rests in an object that can't withstand the battle. It can only rest in the finished work of Jesus. I want you to look with me in Ephesians chapter two. Look at what God says. But God, verse four, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that at the coming age, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Church, we can take refuge in Christ Jesus. We can take refuge in the cross because it is in the cross and it is in the work of Jesus. It is in that empty tomb that we see that God is for us. You, maybe you came in here today and you desperately need to be reminded that the gospel screams to us that God is for you. As those fiery darts, those arrows are raining down on your life, maybe you've been trying to dodge them on your own or combat them in your own strength. And what you need to do this morning, just like David, is take refuge in that shield and in that moment see the cross. Because when we see the cross, we see that God is for us. Amen. You see, the cross extinguishes those flaming darts. You see, the cross, the message of the gospel that Jesus lived and he died and he was buried and he rose again, that extinguishes, the gospel extinguishes those darts and those lies of Satan. See, it's in the cross that we understand that there is hope in hopeless situations. It's in the cross that we know that the grave is not the end. It's in the cross that we can understand that our citizenship is in heaven, so this world is not our home. It's in the cross that our greatest need was met, and so why would our loving Heavenly Father not meet all of our needs? You see, it's in the cross that we understand that we are loved, that we are not alone, that we are valuable because the Son of God died for us. 
You see, it's in the cross that we understand that God chose to adopt us into his family. It is in the cross that we see that God poured out his wrath on his own son so that he, we could be reconciled and accepted to him. The cross proves that God will work all things together for good for those who are called and those who are his children. It's because of the cross that we are forgiven in Christ so the past does not define us. It is in the cross that we see the power of sin is broken. So that addiction, that thing that you, that you think enslaves you and holds you in bondage, has been, you have been set free from that because Christ poured out his blood for you. And it is in the cross we see God's strength can be made perfect in our weakness. You see, every flaming dart that could be hurled at your life by the enemy can be extinguished when we look to the cross. When we look to the cross. So this morning, what are we to do with this text? Maybe this morning you're here and, and it has become abundantly clear to you that the object of your faith has been misplaced. You're hiding behind the wrong shield. And so this morning, maybe you need to bow your knee and surrender your life to Jesus Christ, to confess your sin, to acknowledge your sin and your brokenness and receive the free gift of salvation that, was off, that is offered by Jesus Christ for you to know him. If that is you, in just a moment, you'll have an opportunity to respond to that gospel message. Maybe this morning, you're sitting here and God wants to use something that you've gone through, a trial, a circumstance that you faced to stand in the gap for someone else, to help them with, with their shield, so to speak. Maybe God could use you to, to communicate to someone else, he's faithful. He will sustain you. I'll stand with you. I'll pray with you and for you. But for all of us, taking up the shield, ask yourself this question, do you need to preach the gospel more consistently to yourself? You see, in those times when, the, when those soldiers would take up those shields, they were usually covered in leather. And so before battle, they would soak them in water so that when those arrows would fly, the, the flames would be extinguished when they hit the shield. You know how we can keep our shields wet? It's by reminding ourselves of the truth of the gospel. When we look to the cross, we're assured of where our hope rests. Amen. When we look to the cross, we have confidence in the midst of the battle, trusting that God, who would not spare his own son, but gave him up as a ransom, loves us, is for us, will sustain us in the midst of the battle. Amen. Would you pray with me as our worship team comes? You're gonna have a chance to respond to how God is speaking to you this morning through his word. In just a moment, we'll have, we'll have ministers here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you're here today and you confess I don't know Jesus Christ. I don't have the shield of faith because my faith has never been placed in him. This morning would be a great day for you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and we would love to help you with that. Amen. Maybe you're here today and you need to say, you know, I've kind of kicked it into cruise control and I've had a lot of life experience, but maybe God wants to use the things I've gone through to help someone else and I need to come alongside someone else and encourage them to pick up the shield of faith and to keep fighting in the battle. Or maybe this morning, in the quietness of this moment where you sit or at this altar, you just need to bow before the Lord and remind yourself of the truth of the gospel so that as those darts rain in, you can more clearly see the cross and so that the lies of the enemy would be dispelled 
and you could be reminded of his goodness. However God is speaking, would you respond to him today? Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Would you use it now? In Jesus' name.